Take your Bibles today and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, good to see you in the Lord's house on this day and you listening by radio and other means. We're glad that you are part of our services as well. We hope that you'll continue to do so and spread the word and tell folks that we're on the air. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 is actually a question that's asked of the disciples. And we'll look at this question today. The Bible says, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Please bless the word of God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. The Word of God is an enigma. Now what I mean by that is that it is um, puzzling. And it really depends upon how you approach the Word of God as to how the Word of God approaches you. The Word of God is written in such a way that it will either heal you or it will kill you. It will either edify you or it will puzzle you. It all depends upon how you respond to the Word of God. When the Word of God is presented to you, if you respond one way, it will build you up. If you respond a different way, it will tear you down. If you respond one way, it will give you a higher understanding. It will give you more light. If you respond a different way, a negative way, then it will cause you to be so confused you can't tell the right hand from the left. It's quite an enigma in that regard. The Bible says somewhere that it's a savor of life unto life and it is a savor of death unto death. That means that if you accept it as life and as the words of life, it will give you eternal life. But if you reject it as untruth, you reject it as some fable, then the Word of God will just twist your mind and turn your mind so that you uh, can't even figure out whether up is down or down is up or right is left or left is right. It's just a, an amazing thing what the Scriptures can do, and it all depends upon whether or not we as human beings accept the Word of God or reject the Word of God. Now, we know the basic theological premise is that if a person accepts the truth of Jesus Christ, that is, He was God manifest in the flesh. He came to this earth. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, then you're born again. You're saved. God puts a new spirit within you. He revives your spirit. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. However, if you reject that truth, either out-and-out rejection or you neglect that truth by simply ignoring it, then the Scripture reveals that you are lost in your sin. And if you die in that state, then you are destined to a devil's hell, a place God never intended a human being to go. The devil, the hell was created for the devil and his angels. But if a man rejects, a woman rejects, rejects Jesus Christ as revealed in the Word of God, then that is the eternal destiny. Now that's the basics, but there's much more to it than that. The Bible is much more complex than just that simple truth. And I'm glad it's simple. I'm glad the gospel is simple. I'm glad it's easy to be understood, that children can accept it. But the Bible is much more complex. For see, as you're reading the Bible, the Bible is reading you. Did you know that? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner and the in, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but the things, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, the context of that statement, manifest in his sight, 
All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The context is the scripture. That's what makes the Bible the world's most unusual book. In fact, the most physical, closest physical thing you have on this earth to God himself is the Bible. Now, I'm not saying, please understand, I'm not saying you should make an, an idol of your Bible. I'm not saying you should worship your Bible. I'm not saying you should bow down to your Bible or pray to your Bible. I'm not saying any of that. But at the same time, I'm also telling us that we ought to be wary of treating the Bible like any other book in the world because it is a different book. Here in Acts chapter 2, after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, the disciples are waiting on the day of Pentecost to arrive. This isn't the first Pentecost. It was established in the Old Testament law, and many Pentecosts have come and gone through the years for the Jewish community. But this Pentecost is an unusual day. It's the 50th day after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it's on that day, and only on that day, there have been many Pentecosts that have come since, but on that one particular Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God descended and filled the disciples of Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost. They were baptized by the Holy Ghost. Peter gets up to preach a sermon on that day and tells the pilgrims that are there at Jerusalem the account of what's happened over the last few weeks. That is the crucifixion, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. No doubt among that great multitude of people that were there, and there were, by the way, 3,000 people saved at the end of this sermon. Among the multitude of people there, there were no doubt those that had gathered there who had been part of that event. They had no doubt, some of them cried out for Jesus Christ to be crucified. But there were also there, with little doubt, pilgrims who had arrived in Jerusalem, were there to celebrate Pentecost, and Peter holds them, as well as all of us, by the way, guilty of the sin of killing Jesus Christ. So the message he presents them is, the Messiah came, you rejected him, you killed him. And their response is, well, what do we do about it? Men and brethren, in light of these facts, what do we do? But there's a phrase here that I want us to focus on. And that phrase is, when they heard this, they heard the word of God preached by Peter, they were pricked in their heart. Pricked in their heart means they recognized the absolute truthfulness of what they had heard. And they became overwhelmed with it. They, they knew that it had an effect upon them, it had an effect upon their conscience, their innermost being. They knew that they couldn't just go on in the continued state that they were, they knew they were in a condition which brought conviction upon their heart and their soul by the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they knew they had to do something. They had to do something about their conscience because it was bothering them. The same thing happens to Saul on the road to Damascus just a few chapters later in chapter 9. He had witnessed the death, the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen had been stoned for preaching the same thing Peter preached. And rather than getting saved, the people were cut to the heart. And they picked up stones and killed Stephen. And Saul witnessed, later he would become Paul, but Saul witnessed what happened to Stephen that day. His face lit up like an angel. He looked up to heavens. He said, he testified and said, I see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, standing at the right hand of the Father. And all those events and those words, Saul heard and it haunted him. And we know that because when Jesus confronts Saul on the road to Damascus, he says to him, Saul, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. There's that word again. Acts 2, they were pricked in their conscience. They were pricked in their heart. Now, so Acts 9 says that, that Saul was being pricked. His conscience was troubled. His heart was being pricked. Now, you and I might be able to affect people's minds, and we might be able to stir their emotions. We might make some speech which will move them socially or politically. That's 
happened in many great speeches across the history of the United States and across the world. People have been stirred into action because of what men have said. But to get to the heart of the matter, for people to be changed, for people to be converted, for people to have a new heart, so to speak, we can't do that. Only God can do that. And so God is stirring their hearts and pricking their hearts because of the truth of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And they say, well, well, what should we do? Should we run and hide? Well, there's a problem with trying to run and hide. The psalmist says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, and whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take up the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be as light about me. Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night is light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. That's Psalm 139. In other words, God's pretty good at hide and seek. He always wins. You can hide. But he'll find you. Adam tried to hide himself in the garden, hide behind the fig leaves. But God found him. God always finds you. So men and brethren, what should we do? Should we hope that God forgets what we've done? Should we hope that God will forget the wrongs we've done, the transgressions for which we're guilty, the sins for which we've perpetuated, the crimes which we've committed? And we know the answer. God won't forget. God is eternal. God will remember. Ecclesiastes 12, 11 says, The words of the wise are as goads. You know what a goad is? A goad's a pointed stick, and it pricks the animal. There's that word again. It pricks the animal. It goads the animal like an ox. And it makes sure it moves forward when it doesn't want to. It makes sure it stays in the straight and narrow path when it wants to wander off. And that's what the words of God are. The words of the wise are as goads. They prick our hearts. They keep us from veering off course. They impart wisdom to the hearer. And they instill in us and continue to re-instill in us the fear of the Lord in them. Regardless how bleak things look, no, no matter how many ways and means people protest otherwise, Everyone, according to the scripture, knows there's a right and there's a wrong. Romans chapter 2, 14 and 15 makes it clear. Even among prominent atheists and secular philosophies, there are actually some absolute rights and wrongs. And you'll find that true with most folks. If you probe deep enough in conversation into the intellectual arguments and get down to the contents, deep down inside, everyone knows there's a universal moral standard. There are things that are right. There are things that are wrong. There are things that you should abide by. There's things that you should avoid. And to go against that means that then we condemn ourselves. People can't even live up to their own standards, much less the standards of the Word of God. And therefore, that drives us to the Savior. And that's where our conscience gets pricked and our hearts get pricked. Maybe there's a time when your heart was pricked. You knew you were wrong. You knew you were a sinner. You knew you were lost. And that's why you prayed to God to have mercy on your soul. But maybe over time, your heart's grown a bit cold and your conscience has become a bit dull your mind has become a bit distracted from what God has said to you. So that leaves you the alternative. And the alternative isn't pretty. If your heart is pricked and you repent, well and good. You remain sensitive to the words of God. And the Bible becomes a savior of life unto life. The word becomes a light unto your path, a lamp unto your feet. You hide its words in your heart and you won't sin against God. But what happens if you don't? 
You ignore that conscience. You ignore that call. You ignore that goad, that pricking of the heart and pricking of the conscience. And you kick against the pricks. What happens? Well, Acts chapter 19 gives us the answer. If you'd like to turn there. Acts chapter 19. Verse 7. And all the men were about twelve, and they went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. In other words, they're preaching the gospel. And verse nine, verse um, nine says, and when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. What happens? Their hearts became hardened. Pricked in the heart and you respond, it stays soft and pliable. And God continues to speak to you and you become like a little child and you repent of your sins. But if not, your heart gets hardened. Like Pharaoh's heart got hardened against the words of God delivered by Moses. Like the Egyptian's heart got hardened against God's people. Even though he wrought wonderfully among them, they did not let the people go. The men of Judah, 2 Kings says, would not hear but harden their necks. Like the neck of their fathers, they believed not in the Lord their God. Despite the fact that God worked miracles and did wonders among them, they refuse to listen. So here's my point, the point of the message. What will you do? Your heart will be pricked. And you will either get pricked in your conscience or it will become hard. You can't remain neutral. You can't say, well, I'll just decide later. It's a savor of life to life. It is a savor of death into death. And it all depends upon how you receive it. And the one thing is that will cause your heart to grow hard the quickest is the deceitfulness of sin. If you begin to think thoughts like, I'll never get caught. If you think, I can get away with it. If you think, no one will ever know. If you think, it's too much of this won't hurt me too much. Then your heart is the breeding ground for growing hard. Like the people who saw Jesus Christ use the loaves and fishes to feed 5,000. Do you know how some people responded to that? They considered not the miracle. For their heart was hardened. Dante Rossetti, a famous artist. I'm sure you've heard of him. He was sitting on a park bench one day reading a newspaper and an older gentleman recognized the master artist and took the bold step of approaching him and asking him if he wouldn't mind looking at some paintings that he had recently completed and evaluate their quality. Rossetti being kind, Stopped what he was doing, picked up the art and looked it over. And even though he wanted to be gentle and kind and let the man down easy, he had to be honest as well. And he told the man that they, the paintings were not very good and they held very little value. The man thanked Rossetti for his time, thanked him for his honesty. Before he left, he, he asked, he said, uh, Master, would you mind taking a moment to look over a few sketches made by a younger man. And Rossetti said, of course he would, and he reviewed them. And with great delight, his, his eyes lit up. This great artist saw this, these things as they were painted, and he saw that this younger artist possessed a great talent. And he says, this, this young man, whoever he is, he should receive training. He has a potential for true greatness. And then the artist says, were these done by your son? The older man dropped his head and said, no, sir. They were completed by me 40 years ago. I wish someone would have said to me then what you've said to me today. It would have changed my life. But I gave up and never pursued the art as my vocation. The point of the story is this. God wants you to meet your full potential. 
And when the Word of God comes to you and pricks you in your heart, it's as if God is saying to you, you show great promise. You have great talent. You have abilities. Give me your heart, and I will show you what potential lies within you. But when we harden our hearts, we do just the opposite. We waste our substance. We miss our potential. We spurn God, and we lose years in which service could be done for Him and others. Life is made up of choices. Of course, eternal life is made up of one choice. Well, what will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? The abundant life, once you're saved, the abundant life that Jesus Christ offers you is based upon whether or not you will hearken to the words of God or not. So when your heart is pricked and you repent, you can live a life to its fullest and its most abundant, always being goaded by Jesus Christ in the right path. But if you allow your heart to become whole, cold and hard and indifferent, there's no amount of preaching, no amount of correction, no amount of rebuke, no matter how much you are reproved, you'll not respond. I close with this. John Newton wrote many great hymns, the most famous Amazing Grace. But he wrote another hymn entitled To Think He Died For Me. And here's how the words go. I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. He fixed his pain-filled eyes on me as near the cross I stood. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My, is, my soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sin, his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Those are the words of a man whose heart was pricked in his conscience. and He changed his life. And God can do the same for you. What will you do with the Word of God? Will your heart be pricked or will your heart be hardened? Let's pray. Father, I pray you'll use the Word of God now. May it go forth, find good soil, prick the hearts of those who hear. Help us not to defile our conscience. Help us, God, to always be sensitive to the words of God and respond in a way that will best bring you glory and honor, that we might walk with you above reproach living a life of full light that we might always be open and sensitive with you to hear your words. May we never grow cold. May we never grow hard. May our necks never get stiff. May we always be open to your word. No matter how much it rebukes, how much it hurts, how much it, it brings us pain, may we always receive it as the words of God to make us better. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.